السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدنا علما رب زدنا علما رب زدنا علما نافعا آمين Alhamdulillah, we have uh, completed four muqaddimat from this book. And in today's session, we will try to cover the fifth and the sixth muqaddimah, bi-idhnillah. In the previous muqaddimah, Imam al-Shatibi, rahimahullah, explained a very important principle in understanding the texts of Quran and Sunnah, and particularly how to use usul al-fiqh in that understanding. He said any mas'ala which is not directly connected with fiqh and practical application in usul al-fiqh is ariya. It's of no, uh, it is of no benefit. So this ilm, usul al-fiqh, should be cleaned of all principles and masail which have creeped into it from other uloom and which don't have any direct practical relevance. This is the claim of Imam al-Shati. And in explaining that, we... Uh, took a very important statement from the great book Al-Mustasfa of Imam Al-Ghazali about Khaltul Uloom, confusing the Uloom and uh, the problem of mixing different Uloom, which leads to confusion and chaos in understanding. So we said, any ilim which we are trying to understand, we can use the principles of other uloom in that particular ilm, but we have to be uh, careful and we have to abstain from khaltul uloom, from mixing the uloom, which leads to confusion. So Imam al-Ghazali rahimullah made a very important point. He said, we will take the mabadi, we will take the principles of other uloom, for example, if we are studying usul al-fiqh and there are some linguistic principles, principles of Arabic language, which we have to use, we will take it from the ilm of Arabic language, but uh, we will take only that part from Arabic language, which is useful or which is practically relevant in usul al-fiqh. So we uh, talked about that. Now again, the fifth muqaddimah and the sixth muqaddimah is further explanation of the same principle. al muqaddimatul khamisa fifth muqaddimah. The title is Karahatul Khawdi Fi Ma La Yambani Alayhi Amalun. Any mas'ala in usul fiqh, which is not directly connected with amal, it is disliked to go deeper into that, or it's disliked to engage with that. Karahatul khawdi fi ma la yambani alayhi amalun. What is the meaning of amal? What is the meaning of action? We will come to that. Imam al-Shatibi says, rahimahullah, kullu mas'alatin la yambani alayhi amalun. Any mas'ala in usul, we are talking about usul principles, la yambani alayhi amalun, on which amal is not based. Amal, action.
Yes, is everyone uh, able to hear properly? Can you hear me? Can you see the slides? Okay. Okay. So any principle, any mas'ala, which does not lead to amal or which is not connected to action directly, fiha, engaging in it, discussing it, understanding it, it is engaging with something on which we don't have any shari evidence or we don't have any shari evidence to prove that it is good to engage in it. Istihsan means praiseworthy. Praiseworthy. So in order to engage with the principle, understand the principle, dedicate our effort in understanding a principle or its application, it is very important to have dalilun uh, shari. It's very important to have shari evidence from Quran, from Sunnah about its praiseworthiness. So we must have ayah or hadith or generally the understanding of Quran and Sunnah that this particular mas'ala or this particular uh, principle is praiseworthy. Okay, so how do we, what is the meaning of praiseworthiness? Praiseworthiness here means it has practical relevance. It creates change in us. It makes us a better Muslim, better human being. It benefits us in dunya or akhirah. And it has some sort of benefit in dunya, which, uh, which remains with us. This benefit remains with us till akhirah. So we can say istihsan here means uh, al maslaha, al maslaha, benefit. Okay. So any masala, any principle in usul al fiqh which is not directly connected with practical application actions of uh, of human beings, and we don't have any shari evidence to prove its praiseworthiness to prove that it's beneficial practically it is uh, it should be removed from usul al fiqh or it does not have any benefit or we must abstain from wasting our time and effort in engaging with that principle okay now this is very clear and it's based on the previous muqaddimah now, Imam Shatibi here, he explains amal. What does he mean by amal? Okay, so any principle which does not lead to amal, action. What is the meaning of action? He says, I mean by the word amal, I mean amalul qalbi wa amalul jawarihi. I mean the actions of the heart. So we have uh, amalul Amalul Qalbi and Amalul Jawarihi. Jawarih means limbs, body parts. Qalb is the heart. Okay, so when he says Amal, he, he, he means the actions of the heart and actions of the limbs. Okay, so we can say the Sharia has been ordained or revealed to purify our batil, inner self, batil, and outer actions, zahir. Okay, zahir is the limbs, and batil is the actions of the heart. In fact, the Sharia do's and don'ts, the actions which we performed by our limbs have been ordained for the purification of the batin, the inner self. We talked about that. We said any hukum, any sharia ruling in our religion, it has been ordained for a higher purpose. For example, salah. Salah has 
particular actions and particular fiqh of zahir, how to establish salah, what are the things which nullify salah, what are the wajibat of salah, what are the pillars of salah, what are the recommended actions of salah. Chapter of salah is very deep in all books of fiqh. But what is the purpose of salah? What is the purpose of all these actions? The purpose is inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. The prayer protects you from evil and immorality. And this is the purpose. Okay. So zahir cleans batin and batin is based on zahir. So it's interconnected. Okay. So by amal, he does not only mean the amal of the limbs, the outer actions. He also means amal of the heart. That's why the salaf, when they used the salaf, the early pious predecessors, sahaba, tabi'een, and their followers, when they used the term fiqh, they would mean the worldview, the aqidah, and the fiqh of batin, the fiqh of uh, the actions of the heart. It also includes the fiqh of the limbs, but primarily they would mean the fiqh, understanding the inner self, understanding the uh, matters of the heart, fixing our aqidah. Okay, so this is how uh, concepts change due to the change in terminology. Imam Ghazali rahimahullah, has beautifully explained this in his Ihya, Ihya al -Ulum, in the beginning chapters. He takes some terms, terminology, and explains uh, this important mas'ala. How concepts in the Ummah for the Muslims change by the change in terminology. Okay, That's why terminology is very important. Al-Mustalah, Istalahat, in order to understand the concepts. For example, take the term taqaddum, development. Taqaddum. Development. What do we mean by, by this term? It has a particular Western connotation in our times, which is uh, restricted in, the meaning is restricted in material development. But as Muslims, when we use this term, do we mean the same? If we, if we live in a country, if we live in a society which is materially developed, we have the best roads, we have the best me medical care, we have the best education, we have all the facilities, but the human beings living in that society have turned into animals, they're morally corrupt. Do we still call it development or not? How do we balance between the spiritual development and the material development. What is awla? What should be preferred? If we have a choice between spiritual development and living in a village which is not materially developed and a society which is materially developed but morally corrupt, what should we choose? So these are important uh, matters. That's why uh, there are some uh, contemporary scholars who in understanding the malaise of the ummah, in understanding the downfall of the ummah, understanding this, understanding the reasons and the causes for the downfall of the ummah, have focused on mustalahat. There is a Moroccan scholar, his name is uh, a Sheikh Shahid Bushikhi. He's a professor also. Moroccan scholars are usually very profound. A Sheikh Shahid Bushikhi. You can just Google him. His takhassus specialization is in Quran and understanding the terminology. And in fact, he considers one of the main reasons for the downfall of the Ummah uh, confusion in uh, understanding the concepts. The confusion in understanding the concepts, which are based on understanding the mustalahat. And he established in Morocco, I think, he has established an institute which aims to revive the understanding of mustalahat. Mustalahat shari'iyah, mustalahat is Islamiyah generally, based on the book of Allah. 
like for example success felicity falah we have material falah and spiritual falah how to balance between that so on and so forth so mustalahat are very important we should also focus on as uh, students of knowledge we should focus on i have told you before that in order to understand a particular ilm or grasp it the main gateway is understanding the terminology used in that ilm and also we must focus on understanding the chain the change the gradual change which occurred and happened in the mustalahat in the terminology so in the later ages the terminology islamic terminology was respected more in the early ages the islamic terminology was more comprehensive okay imam ghazali rahimahullah has explained this beautifully in the beginning of ihya you can refer to that okay so amalul qalb and amalul jawari amalul qalb its domain is the ilm of suluk or tasawwuf how to understand the inner self what are the diseases of the heart what are uh, how to revive our heart what are the obligations on the heart what are the haram actions committed uh, uh, by the heart it is a field of knowledge in itself and it's very deep and our scholars have contributed greatly to this field so if you compare the contribution of the scholars of nafs nafsiya or sufiya you can call them or suluk compare it with psychology modern psychology and the contributions of even muslim psychologists you will be astonished to see the profundity of the early scholars again for example imam al ghazali rahimahullah he amazes me his discussions about nafs are amazing very deep there's another scholar which i personally i read his books i study him and uh, his his tamakkun uh, and malaka his capability in understanding the inner self is great his name is imam zarruq al fasi from fez from uh, from tunis a great scholar from tunisia again from from the western part of the muslim world you can refer to his books imam zarruq al fasi you can uh, google him inshallah you'll find his books so imam al shatibi by amal he means amal, amal of the heart and amal actions of the limbs okay so any masala which is not directly connected with amal should be removed from usul al fiqh it does not have any benefit for a muslim and this is very important it's very really important to understand the nature of our religion our deen is directly connected with amal action our deen is not philosophy philosophy or ideology which does not have any practical relevance and for that uh, to understand this uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in explaining the awsaf the main qualities of the ummah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has used a very important term in explaining this explaining the nature of our religion and how should we engage with our deen in practice in da'wah in research in all fields uh, that is the wasf the quality of ummiyah this is an unlettered ummah so we don't reflect usually we don't reflect on on these great and deep qualities when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a famous hadith and uh, imam ash-shatibi has uh, discussed this in the explanation of this muqaddima uh, he says the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa qala alayhi salam the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said nahnu ummatun ummiyah we are unlettered ummah Okay, so this quality I'm reading from uh, Muwafaqa directly. This quality of ummiyah. Ummiyah means unlettered. Okay, what is the meaning? Yani this hadith is famous. This hadith has been narrated by Imam Muslim in his Sahih and uh, the muhaddithun, other muhaddithun. What is the meaning? of ummiyah we are unlettered ummah 
does it mean we don't need to engage in knowledge? There is no benefit in acquiring knowledge. It is sunnah to remain unlettered. The Prophet ﷺ was unlettered. It's sunnah to follow follow his uh, his his uh, to follow the Prophet ﷺ in this particular quality. No, it does not mean that. We know the importance of knowledge, acquiring knowledge, promoting knowledge in Islam. Everyone knows that. And the beginning wahi revealed to the Prophet ﷺ is about knowledge. Iqra, read. So no one, we don't need evidences for that. Everyone knows that. What is the meaning? The Prophet ﷺ said, نَحْنُ أُمَّةٌ أُمِّيَّةٌ لَا نَحْسِبُ وَلَا نَكْتُبُ We don't calculate, we neither cal calculate and nor write. And this hadith is about a particular mas'ala, you know, calculating, uh, citing the moon for uh, the beginning of uh, the Hijri months. It's a particular mas'ala in fiqh. We are not going into that. But this was of ummiyah, what does it mean? It means that Islam is straightforward. Islam is not a vague philosophy, which is difficult for people to understand. It's not a philosophy. It's not an ideology. It's a religion which is based on strong worldview, which is clear, easy for everyone to understand. And this is the meaning of yusr, al-yusr, ease of the sharia. And this wasf, al-yusr, ease, has also been repeated in many ayat of the Quran. And also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned it in many hadith. For example, in one hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, that this religion is samha. Bu'ithtu bil hanifiyyat is samha. I have been sent with uh, hanifiyya, uh, oneness, tawheed, oneness of God, and samha, ease. What is the meaning of ease? It means that this religion is not based on vague uh, philosophy. This is what Imam al-Shatibi tries to understand. So don't philosophize this religion and in, in interpretation, in understanding, uh, he says, follow the methodology of the Arabs. And it, the importance of Arabic language for a mujtahid and understanding the, uh, the Arabic asalib understanding the asali, the styles and modes of thinking of the Arabs. It's not only about language. Yani he, he mentions it here. And in this book, he has repeatedly focused and, or, and emphasized on understanding the Arabic language in understanding the Sharia. At some places he says, in the Sharia ta Arabiya, the Sharia is Arabic Sharia. Only an Arab or a person who understands the asali of the Arab can understand it. And for this reason, in uh, conditions of a mujtahid, he mentions in the, in the chapter of Ijtihad, from the conditions of the mujtahid is understanding Arabic language. But he says a mujtahid can, uh, can be a muqallid, a blind follower in some areas of knowledge, like hadith. If he's not an expert in hadith, he can blindly follow a muhaddith. In order to understand the hukum of a hadith, he can ask it from a muhaddith, from an expert of hadith. But in Arabic language, this will not be accepted. He must be at the level of best scholars of Arabic. Not only a scholar, but best scholars. Because of the importance of understanding the uh, asalib, uh, the, the thinking patterns and, and uh, styles of, of Arabs. And what is the main nature of uh, the, the, the thinking patterns of the Arabs? That uh, it was simple, straightforward. No philosophy. Okay, that's why uh, when scholars study the history of the Muslim thought, they say uh, misunderstandings and misinterpretations entered the Muslim thought when non-Arabs accepted Islam. Romans and Persians they came with the, with their cultural baggage, and the starting point or the turning point was the movement of translation initiated by. Uh, the Khalifa Mamu, right? So we'll not go into that. What are the pros and cons, benefits? This is what uh, he uh, says here. So he, he quotes, uh, we have two words, Ummiyah, this, this Sharia 
And the Prophet Sallallahu said, we, we, the Ummah is Ummatun Ummiyah. So Ummiyah does not mean unlettered here. The literal translation will be unlettered, but Ummiyah means uh, Islam is straightforward. And in this context, it means that any mas'ala we discuss, any principle we discuss should be directly connected with Amal. It should create a change in the Ummah between the Muslims. Another word which uh, Imam al-Shatibi, another term which he has taken from the texts and from the athar of the Sahaba is takalluf. Takalluf, takalluf. Exaggeration, unnecessary exaggeration. We have been uh, prohibited in our understanding and thought of the Sharia of Quran and Sunnah from unnecessary takalluf. Okay. For example, he quotes Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu an, and we know Umar is one of the greatest Sahaba Mufti, and uh, the methodology of ijtihad adopted by the scholars later on are based on understanding of the Sahaba, particularly understanding and ijtihadat of Umar. There is a very beautiful book. If you study it, inshallah, it will benefit you. By Imam Waliullah al dahlawi Rahimahullah al-Shah Waliullah al dahlawi Its name is Fiqhu Umar. Fiqhu Umar. In that book, he has, uh, he has explained the ijtihadi methodology of Umar. And later on, the scholars, how they connected their method with the method of Umar in particular. So Umar radiallahu an, and because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him more time in Khilafah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed him with 10 years of Khilafah, Roman and Persian empires were opened for Islam in his Khilafah. So naturally, his ijtihadat are very important. Uh, he quotes this author, which has been uh, narrated by Imam al-Bukhari in Muslim, that Umar radiallahu an, he recited this ayah from Surah to Abasa, ayah 31. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa in, uh, in narrating the, the blessings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us in this dunya, Allah says, I have gr granted you faqihatan wa abba, fruits and abba. So what is this abba? He says, Umar used to say, hadhi al we know the faqiha, we know the fruits. What is the meaning of Ab? And then he would say, Thumma qal, Nuhina ani takalluf. We have been prohibited from unnecessary exaggeration. Okay? Because if you don't know the meaning of this particular word, it does not uh, stop you from understanding, general understanding of the sentence. And the general understanding here is, uh, appreciating the ni'am of Allah, appreciating the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, being thankful and grateful for the blessings, using those blessings to please Allah. Yani this is the general meaning of the sentence. If you understand it, you don't need to understand uh, the uh, meaning of ajza, of the branches. Of if, or if you don't understand the meaning of a particular word in this general scheme, it does not harm you. So he used the word takalluf. And we are talking about understanding. Forget about practice. This course is about understanding, nurturing understanding. So this quality of ummiyah, this Islam, this uh, our religion uh, does not philosophize concepts. It, is, it has ease and uh, we have been prohibited from takalluf. It's all in understanding. These are the main qualities in understanding. And if we keep these principles, and if we use these principles and understand these principles, apply them in understanding Quran and Sunnah, we will reach the best intended meanings. And the application based on that will uh, be beneficial for the Ummah and uh, the Muslims. Yes, let's read more from the book. He says, he moves to Dalil. He has given some adilla, but as, as we have said, that 
uh, here we have summarized the muqaddimat. You can go back to the book and read uh, the muqaddimah in the details. He says, وَالدَّلِيلُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ إِسْتِقْرَاءُ الشَّرِيعَةِ Again, he has invoked istiqra of the sharia. The evidence for this concept is istiqra of the sharia. And when we study sharia as a whole, we conclude that the main quality of the sharia is that it does not philosophize the concepts. It's straightforward. And it's connect, directly connected with amal. Okay. Then he gives some examples. For example, he says, فَإِنَّا رَأَيْنَا الشَّارِعَةِ يُعْرِضُ عَمَّا لَا يُفِيدُ عَمَلًا مُكَلَّفًا بِهِ He says, we have seen the legislator, Sharia is Allah. In his ahkam, in Sharia rulings, ignoring the details which don't lead to amal. مُكَلَّفًا بِهِ yani which, uh, which is not included in our legal responsibility. We, have, we don't have to apply it. For example, this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَهِلَّةِ قُلْ هِيَ مَوَاقِيتُ لِلنَّاسِ وَالْحَجِّ They ask you about the new precepts, the new moons. قُلْ say, O Prophet, هِيَ مَوَاقِيتُ لِلنَّاسِ وَالْحَجِّ It is to uh, know the timings of uh, the months and hajj. Okay? Because to understand uh, the, the lunar months, it helps in application. It's important in apply, applying many rulings for both men and women. And also Hajj, understanding the timings of the Hajj is application. We have to apply it in our life. Okay, so they were asking about something. They were asking about the nature. Yani why does the moon go through different stages? It, it, it becomes a crescent and then uh, the size increases. What is the reason? And the answer was given about the benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not explain the nature of the change which occurs in the moon. Allah gave a straightforward answer which is connected with amal. And this is the Quranic method. So he says, The jawab, the answer came about what is connected with action. Knowing the beginning, beginnings of the lunar months and the Hajj. Wamin Huna, Naha sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he gives another example from the hadith. He says, from this or from this method is the prohibition of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and qila wa qal wa kathrati su'al. From uh, engaging in unnecessary questions, unnecessary qil and qal, unnecessary discussions futile discussions. So the Prophet Sallallahu forbade and prohibited from asking a lot of questions. Why? Because if you exaggerate in asking questions, you ask a lot of questions every time, you can uh, cross the limits. You can fall into asking about things which are of no benefit, which are of no practical relevance. Okay. Then he quotes Imam Malik. He says, وَقَدْ كَانَ مَالِكِ بْنُ أَنَسْ يَكْرَهُ الْكَلَامَ فِي مَا لَيْسَ تَحْتَهُ عَمَلُ For this reason, Imam Malik ibn Anas, who is one of the greatest scholars, he disliked uh, asking about things which are not connected directly with amal. وَيَحْكِي كَرَاهِيَّتَهُ عَمَّنْ تَقَدَّمْ And he would narrate its prohibition uh, or its disliked nature from his uh, teachers. He has quoted Imam Malik because uh, Imam al-Shatibi was a Maliki scholar. And this has been narrated from many Salaf. We have this idea in fatwa of asking about things which have not occurred yet. The Salaf, the early Salaf, Sahaba and Tabi'in would usually and generally avoid answering questions about things which have not occurred yet. Yani if someone would approach them with a question, they would ask him, is, has this occurred or not? If the answer would be no, it has not occurred yet, they would say, come and ask when it happens. This, is, this was the 
يعني this was the methodology, general methodology of the Salaf and the scholars of the Dibb. Except we have uh, a particular group of scholars who, who adopted a different methodology, the Hanafis. The Hanafis imagined problems and they wrote about it. They gave fatwas for imaginary problems. Yani, uh, this was disliked by non-Hanafi scholars, but uh, it, it also contains benefit. And they were called Ara'ayti Yum, yani Ara'ayta. What is your opinion if so and so happens? It has not occurred yet. What, what is your opinion if th this and that happens? Okay, so they imagined uh, problems and gave answers to those problems uh, to, to, to guide the future generations of the Ummah. And it has been helpful. Yeah? And if you read the uh, books of Fatawa, they have imagined such problems that in their times, people, people would have laughed at them. People would have ridiculed them. But these problems happened <coughs> in our times. For example, some Hanafi jurists, they imagine a problem in the early centuries of Islam. They say, what if a person prays salah carrying najasa in his pocket? People would have ridiculed them. Yani, who, who carries najasa in his pocket? But it has happened in our times. We have the urine bags and stuff. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure all sick uh, of the ummah. And there are other, other masail which they have discussed. For example, a Hanafi jurist in his, in his, his one of his books on fatawa, he says, how should a person pray if he, if he's hanging between heavens and the earth? If he's hanging between skies and earth, he's hanging in between. People would have ridiculed them, the scholar. How can a person hang in between? Now, it has occurred. We travel in the plains. We're hanging between the, the skies and the earth. How should we pray? So on and so forth. So the general, the overwhelming majority, they adopted uh, the methodology of ihtiyat, precaution. They would never engage in discussions about things which are, or about problems which, have, which, had ne which had not occurred yet. But a group of scholars, the Hanafis, they took a different path. So both of them are on the Sharia, but uh, this was their method. But the overwhelming majority, they adopted the method of precaution. So this is what he explains in this muqaddimah. And we have seen this in our times also, yani in da'wah, in explaining deen, understanding uh, religion. We see uh, the students of knowledge, youth, there is a nahda, there is a revival in uh, understanding the ulum of Islam, alhamdulillah. We see a lot of youth from the ummah uh, coming back to understanding the sciences of Islam, engaging in learning Arabic, uh, the ulum of Islam. But again, the problem is because of not understanding this mas'ala and uh, the confused teachers, they waste a lot of their time in uh, engaging and understanding masail which are, which, which are of no practical benefit. Like, for example, the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the nature of attributes and all this stuff, theology, ilmul kalam. That's why kalam was disliked by some of the early scholars. For example, we have, it has its benefit, no doubt, but it was disliked. For example, we have, uh, from the early salaf, we have Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah. We know Imam al-Shafi'i lived in times when there was a lot of discussion about theology. Deviant groups, Mu'tazila, and uh, even the state adopted some deviant opinions and uh, they, uh, there was a trial for the scholars who did not follow the state virgin and so on and so forth. He lived in those times. The Abbasid Khilafa, Imam al-Shafi'i. But we don't see anywhere uh, in the works of Shafi'i, rahimahullah, even slightest ishara or mention of the theological matters. He concerned himself with fiqh, with fiqh and usul fiqh. So one day, one of his students, Imam al-Muzani, is one of the greatest students of Imam al-Shafi'i, and he 
uh, he summarized the works of Imam al-Shafi as well, al-Umm. He summarized it, Mukhtasar al-Muzani. Muzani is considered one of the best students. One day, Imam al-Muzani approached him and said, Oh, Imam, I see every scholar these days engaging himself in understanding theology, aqidah, deviant groups, philosophy, all these, and uh, refuting them. And you don't speak about these matters. You're only concerning yourself with fiqh and usul of fiqh. What is the benefit? Why don't you talk about theology? Why don't you talk about kalam and all these matters? What was the answer of Imam al-Shafi'i? Imam al-Shafi'i gave a beautiful answer. We have two versions of that. In one version, he said, uh, do you know where, where, where are you standing now? He said, of course, I am in your house. He said, no, anta fi taran. You are in Atlantic Ocean. A taran is a particular place in Atlantic Ocean where all ships would sink. Wallahu alam, maybe Bermuda Triangle, who knows? But he said, no, 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 you are not in my house. You are in taran. Yani you, you are trying to engage in uh, things which will drown you. In another uh, version, he said, Ya Bunay, oh my loving child, oh my student, engage yourself in matters in which if you commit a mistake, all nasu akhtata. People will say, you have committed a mistake. Yani if you commit a mistake in fiqh, in, in, in your uh, responses about salah, about zakah, about hajj, about anything, the, the maximum or the, or, or the worst you can fall into is mistakes. People will say, Akhtata, you have given a wrong fatwa. Not more than that. Avoid engaging in an area in which if you commit a mistake, people will say, Kafarta, that you have disbelieved. Yani don't enter into aqidah matters. Leave the Muslims on the basic aqidah which they have. Okay? But the times have changed also in our times. We must have some students of knowledge and scholars who fulfill this fardu kifaya of understanding the deeper philosophical matters and kalami matters, and they engage in discussions with atheists and clear the doubts of the ummah, that is there. That is there, but here we must understand the overall structure of our deen and sharia. Okay, then Imam al-Shatibi, rahimahullah, he, uh, he, uh, mentions the reasons of avoiding this method. Yani he says here, we must have, in order to accept the mas'ala or engage in understanding the uh, principle, particularly in usul of fiqh, it must, it must have a valid dalil that this mas'ala is praiseworthy. Okay? And what is praiseworthy? which is connected with amal. Any mas'ala which is connected with amal, which uh, leads to action is praiseworthy. Anything which does not lead to action is not praiseworthy in our sharia. Then he mentions the reasons for that. He says, He mentions the reason of, uh, of, of avoiding this method, which does not lead to amal. And he, in that, he mentions the philosophers. And I will not read it completely. You can go back to the book. So he says here, or let's read this. He says, number one, because if a mas'ala, if a principle does not lead to amal, uh, no benefit of dunya and akhira is based on that. Okay, so if if we are engaging and we are uh, uh, we are spending our efforts in understanding things which don't be, which neither benefit us in dunya practically and akhira, uh, it it is unpraiseworthy in our sharia. فأمّا, as far as akhira is concerned, فإنه يسأل عما أمر به ونهي عنه because he, in Akhirah, he will be asked about do's and don'ts. Did he fulfill the do's and did he avoid the don'ts? And in dunya, and in dunya, if he engages in a knowledge which does not benefit him practically, it is of no benefit. Then he, here, he mentions the philosophers. 
He says, this is the method of philosophers who waste their time and effort in discussing matters which don't benefit the mankind practically. He says, uh, Yani reflecting and uh, engaging in understanding everything, nature of everything, is the method of philosophers, which are rebuked by the Muslims. Muslims don't follow their path. Okay, this is what I what I said when we uh, explained the ummiyah nature of this ummah, as the Prophet said. Okay, it does not mean that we don't have profound concepts in Islam. It does not mean that. It means that these concepts, whether simple or profound, simple or complex, are directly connected with action. They are beneficial in dunya and akhira. They are not only theoretical. They are not only philosophy. Uh, it is not only philosophy in the mind of a philosopher. Okay, so. Uh, then he, in this third point, in the explanation, he answers the doubt that al-ilmu mahbubun ala jumla, ilm generally is praiseworthy, any knowledge increasing uh, in knowledge, understanding more knowledge is praiseworthy. Why should we avoid <coughs> knowledge uh, which is not practically beneficial for us? Then he explains uh, the reasons. And he also uh, in, a, in, in, in explaining uh, in, in Ajwiba, in the, in the responses, he uh, refutes the scientific interpretation of the Quran. So he says, whenever we read an ayah, we must try to reach the intended meaning. We should not waste our time in, uh, in uh, distorting the Meaning, we should not distort the meaning of the ayah. Like some uh, scholars of science who distorted the meanings of the ayat of the Quran. Because Quran is not a book of science. So he mentions it here in the explanation. So how does he, how does he explain? He says, وَكَذَلِكَ الْقَوْلُ فِي كُلِّ عِلْمٍ يُعْزَى إِلَى الشَّرِيْعَةِ لَا يُؤَدِّي فَائِدَةَ أَمَلٍ Every uh, every principle, every ilim which does not uh, connect itself with action is of no benefit. And it's unknown to the Arabs. See, again, he connects it with Arabs. By Arabs, he means the thinking patterns of the early Arabs, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba. And for this reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the last and final sharia and wahi uh, to the Arabs. There were other civilized nations. There were other uh, languages also. Yani we have the Romans, the Persians, and others. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose the Arabs only? There is hikmah in that. Because the thinking patterns and the asalib of the Arabs were straightforward. No philosophy. Okay? Then he says, فَقَدْ تَكَلَّفَ أَهْلُ الْعُلُومِ الْتَبِعِيَّةِ The people of science those who are experts in natural sciences, they exaggerated. He's talking about Muslims, of course. Muslim scientists and so on and so forth. They exaggerating, they exaggerated in uh, using the ayat of the Quran to prove their theories. And those ayat, if you reflect on, on those ayat, the, intending, the intended meaning was something else. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the diversity in this universe, the mountains, uh, the camel, for example, Allah says, reflect on the camel. Basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to engage in the research of the camel. The intended meaning is different. The intended meaning is the diversity you see has been created by Allah. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the intended meaning. And he refutes this further uh, in uh, this muqaddima okay so so these are the main points of the muqaddima and uh, in answering responding to the doubts 
one of the main points here, which he explains is when we say Sharia is easy, we are unlettered ummah, we should not engage in philosophy. It does not mean that Quran does not contain profound concepts. It does not mean that, as we said. He explains it here. Okay, he says uh, there are two methods of understanding uh, concepts: the method of the Quran, and which is uh, a simple method of understanding the same concept, and the method of uh, the uh, philosophers or com complex method. And this is the topic for the next uh, muqaddimah. Inshallah, we'll take this muqaddimah in the next uh, session, bi'idhnillah. So what does he say here? He says, أن الشرع قد جاء ببيان ما تصلح به أحوال العبد في الدنيا والآخرة على أتم الوجوه وأكملها. The Sharia has indeed uh, it has come, it has been revealed to explain what benefits uh, a slave, a human being in dunya and akhirah. Ala atam al wujuhi wa akmaliha in the best way, in the most perfect way. Fama kharaja an dalika kad yudhannu annahu ala khilafi dalik. Wahu wa mushahadun fi tajribiya tajriba al adiyya. Al adiyya. Fa in amat al mushtagirina bil ulumi lati la tatalaku biha thamaratun taklifiya tadhulu alayhim fi al fitna wal khuruj and sirat al mustaqim. So anything which which is not based on that method and uh, which does not have samara taklifiya and it reflect on this word here samara means fruit taklifiya comes from taklif taklif is legal responsibility legal responsibility and if we are mukallaf mukallaf are only two beings from the creation human beings and jinns okay so any ilm any principle any masala <coughs> which does not have thamara uh, taklifiya which does not lead to uh, application in fulfilling our legal responsibility as human beings uh, it is of no benefit. This is the claim. And in that, those who engage in ulum, which, which don't have any uh, taklifiya fruit, which, does not, which don't have any practical fruits, which change us as, which help us in, in application, they, they, they can fall into fitna, uh, in, in fitna and khuruj and sirat al mustaqim, and it can lead them astray from the straight path. Number three, he says, We said this is the methodology of uh, the philosophers. So at the end of the Muqaddimah, Imam al-Shatibi says, When this has been proved, what is the claim? That any mas'ala, any principle, anything, any concept in our religion, it has practical relevance. It must have thamara taklifiya. The fruit must be practical, which we apply in our lives, which changes us and benefits us in this dunya and akhirah. When this has been established, fasawabu, the right methodology is anything which is not based on amal is ghayru matlub. It's not praiseworthy in the sharia. Sharia does not demand it. It may have some benefit, but we are talking about Sharia. It may have some benefit in other fields of knowledge, human sciences. We are talking about the Sharia. And uh, any ilm which has some benefit outside usul al fiqh, like the language, grammar, tafsir, and ulum, uh, which are helpful in understanding the principles of understanding, they are maqloob, yani they are uh, demanded by the sharia. 
إما شرعاً وإما أقلاً. Either they are demanded and praiseworthy in Sharia from the Sharia point of view or أقلاً from uh, based on the intellect. حسب ما تبين في موضعه. لكن هنا معنى آخر لا بد من الالتفات إليه. But we must understand another important meaning, which is very important to understand, or we must take it into consideration. Okay. Then he moves to مقدمة السادسة. يعني in explaining the Quranic method of understanding the concepts and the non-Quranic method of understanding the concepts. Okay. By this مقدمة, المقدمة السادسة, the sixth مقدمة, he wants to explain the confusion which may arise from the previous مقدمة that uh, Islam uh, is simple in nature and the concepts Islam wants to prove are very simplistic uh, and there is no philosophy, no prof profundity, uh, no deepness. We don't, yani, this is one of the problems which the modern Islamic thought or Muslim thought faces is facing. Sim simplistic interpretations, simplistic methodology, and it, it uh, harms in application. So the answer is al-muqaddima al-sadisa. How to differentiate between Quranic way of understanding things, understanding concepts, and non-Quranic way of understanding or the philosophical way of understanding uh, concepts. So, so, the key words from this muqaddimah, as we said, are, uh, and in understanding, we're talking about understanding. We're not talking about practice. Uh, the practical aspect is discussed in fiqh. We are talking about usul of fiqh. What are the keywords? The keywords are uh, no takalluf, no exaggeration, no unnecessary uh, exaggeration in understanding the concepts or uh, under, in, in understanding generally. Uh, Ummiya, unlettered. Nature of Islam because the Prophet said, Nahnu ummatun ummiya, we are unlettered ummah. La nahsibu wala naktub. We neither count nor write. That's why the early tradition of Islam is oral tradition, it's, it's based on hifid, oral tradition. You know, they say that Arabs would even memorize the lineage of their horses. Now forget about other concepts. And the third is Yusuf, ease, the concept of ease. Okay, but it must be put into perspective. And ease does not, ease has been wrongly understood. Ease, uh, the concept of ease should be, its explanation should be taken from Quran and Sunnah. Okay, here we are talking about ease in understanding. So no philosophy, no exaggeration in thought, straightforward, it can be understood by a layman and uh, a philosopher, an intellectual. Of course, the levels will not be same, but the concepts will be same. The concepts are same. So, for example, God is one, oneness of God, Tawheed. The concept is same for a layman and for an intellectual, but maybe an intellectual understands it uh, on a different level. He understands the adilla, the evidences for the oneness of God. He has the capability of uh, clearing the doubts about oneness of the God, so on and so forth. But at the end, the concept is same. So this is the beauty of Islamic thought. Let's stop here at this muqaddimah. And uh, inshallah, we are on track. This is session six. Alhamdulillah, we have uh, completed five muqaddimah. And uh, we have a uh, few more muqaddimat remaining. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us understanding and istiqama in uh, completing this course, insha'Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us in uh, understanding the concepts, mafahim. Right? It's very important, mafahim. In our times, mafahim have been messed up. Sometimes even as a scholar, Muslim scholar, we commit mistakes in understanding the concepts. It's very important for us as Muslims
to clear our mafahim, to clear uh, or to base our personalities individually at individual level and at the level of the ummah on Islamic concepts, not on alien concepts or Western concepts. Yani sometimes we uh, misunderstand. We take the term from Islam and the meanings we give to it are totally alien, Western. Or sometimes we borrow the term, both the term and the meaning from the alien worldviews. We have a unique worldview which uh, leads to uh, the concepts which are unique and which are uh, firmly established in Islamic worldview. We must understand it. It's very important. And we can say it is uh, from the foundations of Islamic revival. Wallahu ta'ala, a'lamu ahkam. You can. You can uh, ask, inshallah, the Q&A is open for everyone, inshallah, in the Telegram channel, inshallah. Let us take some questions. Okay. <clears throat> uh, where in the notes under which muqaddimah is the concept of interpreting the scientific details of Quranic ayah that we mentioned? It is in the same muqaddimah. Muqaddimah 5. Inshallah, you go back to the, to the original work. Uh, the English translation will find it there. Inshallah, he has mentioned uh, this in al muqaddima al khamisa are actions part of iman of course actions are part of iman there is no doubt in that see again when we talk up when we discuss concepts it must have practical relevance let's take this example yani uh, this uh, masala of action or actions part of iman it confused a lot of muslims in the early generations of islam when there were deviant sects uh, yeah, and, uh, preaching their uh, deviant concepts. So as a Muslim, it's sufficient for me to understand that actions are important for me by claiming Islam or uh, declaring Islam, whether I'm born in a Muslim family or I revert to Islam, only by declaration of the Shahada, it will not be accepted. I must fulfill the conditions of the Shahada. And one of the main conditions of the Shahada is action. Action. Beginning with the pillars of Islam and then all types of good deeds, I must do my best. Okay. So this is sufficient for a Muslim to understand basic. But what is the theological discussion surrounding this masala? Is Iman part of, uh, is, is our actions part of Iman or not? And if you go back to the discussion in Ilm kalam you will see there are two groups of uh, in the early or the two sects in the early uh, history who uh, which engaged in uh, uh, in in polemics about this masala al khawarij and al murji'a murji'a they said their claim was that actions are not part of iman and they have different shades shades and yani murji'a had uh, different sub uh, sects also uh, under the main umbrella. And then we have Khawarij. They claimed that some sins can take a person out of the fold of Islam. Kabair, the major sins lead a Muslim out of, out of the fold of Islam. Both these methods or understandings are deviant, extreme. So scholars engaged in this discussion. They talked about action because every Muslim believed it's, it's, it's clear from the Quran. But when you dig deeper, you will find what they discussed was more theological. Yeah, it, it does not have any practical relevance. This is what we are talking about. They discussed about the nature of actions. Are actions uh, a condition for the validity of Iman? Or are actions 
only a condition for the perfection of Iman. So if you have actions with you, you are acting on uh, the, the commands of Allah and his messenger, your Iman becomes more perfect. Your Iman becomes better. Or if you avoid actions, we will see a Muslim, he never prays, he does not give zakah, he, he has the capability of performing the Hajj, he does not do that. Uh, is, is he still a Muslim? If you say uh, actions are sharp to kamal, actions are a condition for the perfection of Iman. It means he is still a Muslim because he has given the shahada. He does not negate any obligation of Islam. So there is difference between negating an obligation and not accepting the obligation, but not acting on it. So he's still a Muslim because actions are part of Iman. Actions are uh, a condition for the perfection of Iman. But you, if you accept the other opinion, which says actions are uh, a condition for the validity of Iman. It means if no actions, no Iman. Again, this is a deeper discussion. Everyone accepted actions part of Iman, but they talked about actions as a condition for the validity of Iman or actions as a condition for the perfection of Iman. This is where they disagree. Okay, so all these discussions, maybe they were beneficial for, the, for, for those times, but they don't, don't benefit us anymore. We should avoid any mas'ala, any principle, any discussion, which does not help us practically. This is what we talked about. Yes, Shahid, could you please tell us the name of the Moroccan scholar, again, who wrote about the importance of terminology. Uh, Sheikh Shahid Abu al -Bushikhi. and he has, he focused on terminology and he dedicated his life to understanding uh, this masala or highlighting this important masala, the, the, the issue of terminology. And he, he has written some uh, great works about this masala. He established an institute where uh, he would uh, train scholars to understand this uh, masala. Yes. Is the attribute of Ummiya general for the Ummah specific to Bani Ismail among the prophets or some was raised as an attribute which distinguished from them from Banu Israel? Uh, secondly, is the Quran, Quranic, uh, okay, let's take the first one. No, it's, 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 uh, it's for the, uh, for, uh, when we use the word Ummah, it has two connotations, Ummah al-Istijaba and Ummah al-Da'wah. Ummatul Istijaba and Ummatul Da'wah. Non-Muslims are also umma of, uh, part of the Ummah, but they are Ummatul Da'wah. Yani Islam should be uh, preached to them. And we have Ummatul Istijaba, those who accept it. This is about Ummatul Istijaba, those who engage in understanding uh, Islam. So the Prophet is, is explaining a very important principle in engaging with Quran, understanding of Islam. Secondly, is the Quranic context or prophetic narration about the Ummiyah? Is it just the mention of a state of the people or is it some attribute to be achieved? If yes, what would be the benchmarks of Ummiyah? No, it is not uh, only the mention of, of the state of the people because this hadith is about a particular hukum and then Allah is, the, the Prophet ﷺ is commanding something also. He mentions this attribute, then he commands about sighting of the moon. Okay, so it's not, but yes, we must discuss Ummiyah I don't think scholars have explained any, we have explanations in uh, the original works, uh, commentaries of hadith, but I don't think uh, there are uh, particular works in explaining uh, the nature of Ummiya. How do we apply it? Yani, particularly in understanding of the realities and understanding of our religion. How do we apply this, this, this concept of Ummiya? You know, some people are confused about this. They think, uh, and I have seen many people who even uh, who are against education, against ilm. They say, no, it's not, it's against sunnah, even to write ilm. So, of course, this, uh, this apparent meaning is not uh, intended by the Prophet. The Prophet is mentioning a wasf, a quality which must be explored, which must be understood. It's very important. That's why uh, I think those who uh, took the pro project of critique against ilm al-kalam and philosophy like Imam Ibn Taymiyyah and others, uh, rahmatullahi alayhim, even Imam al-Ghazali himself, they invoked these concepts. The concept of fitrah, 
Yeah, the concept of uh, understanding based on fitrah, adilla, from the adilla, from the evidences, rational evidences, fitrah is the best, best evidence. And also, they invoke the concept of umiyya against philosophy, philosophical um, uh, methodology in, uh, in understanding concepts. Philosophy is a branch in itself. We're not discussing about that. We're talking about sharia, how to understand deen, religion. Philosophy is a great field of knowledge. You may study it, you may use it, no problem. But we're talking about the religion, religion of Islam. So yes, those who uh, took the project of critique against philosophy and against ilm kalam they invoked these concepts. Can you explain, expand on this? Which opinion do we take in regards to Iman and action? The Khawarij or the Murji wave? Yeah, they, uh, the best opinion in my, uh, in my view is that actions are a condition in the perfection of Iman. Actions are a condition in the perfection of Iman. But there are certain actions about which scholars have agreed that if you miss those actions, if you avoid those actions, if you don't perform those actions, it may lead a Muslim to disbelief because of the strength of those actions and the evidences behind it, like prayer, salah, the pillars, generally the five pillars. And from the five pillars, salah and zakah. And from these two pillars, salah, the importance of salah. That's why scholars have uh, disagreement about a Muslim who does not pray. Does he remain a Muslim or he's out of Islam? They have agreed on the punishment that it's a it, 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 it carries punishment in Islamic law. But is this punishment because this Muslim has become a, an apostate or he's still a Muslim, but uh, the punishment is just uh, a, a reminder for him? Scholars have dis disagreed. Yani you can read this discussion from any book of fiqh, in any madhab, Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, any book in the chapter of Salah. What is the ruling of uh, missing the prayer and they, then they go into the details okay so we take the balanced middle opinion we say actions are part of iman full stop if we further explain it actions are a condition in the perfection of iman not in the validity of iman but yes certain actions show because of their strength and the evidences behind it certain actions if you miss it it shows that Iman has been invalidated in your heart. Or there are certain sins, if a person commits it, it shows that Iman has been invalidated in the heart. Yani this is the best balanced opinion which we can take. So in the concept of Khalqul Ulum, we can learn philosophy as a student, but we should not mix it with Sharia. No, try to understand it. Yani what I explain is more profound. We can study anything we want, inshallah, which is beneficial for us. There are certain ulum which are prohibited, like magic, for example, magic, uh, astrology, and other ulum, which, because of the nature, are uh, haram. Yani in our sharia, as a Muslim, we should not engage in those ulum. But majority of the ulum are good beneficial for us. We should, we should uh, study, we can study, we can learn, it's not a problem. Uh, particularly philosophy. It's very important to understand basic philosophical concepts in, a, in order to understand the reality we're living. The Western civilization, the concepts, the realities, the political philosophy, the economic philosophy, the worldview, it's good, it's not a problem. But what we are trying to explain here and what Imam Shatibi explains, how to understand our deen, how to understand our deen. We don't need alien fields of knowledge to explain our religion. We don't need, uh, in order to understand the book of Allah, we, didn't, we don't need the help of human sciences to understand the book of Allah. This is the, this is the point. Alhamdulillah, in the book of Allah, we can extract all principles which are helpful in understanding the book of Allah. So we don't uh, rely on anything outside the book. We take it from inside the book. Yani this is this is the 
methodology. But yes, we can use other all of And from the Sharia sciences, Arabic language, uh, tafsir, hadith, we, in order to understand a particular ilm, like usul al fiqh, we can take the mabadi from those ulu. We can take, and we should take the basic uh, principles from that ulu. And we should not mix the uh, different ulu because it does not lead to desirable result. Okay, so this is the method of understanding the ulum of Islam. I hope uh, it's clear, inshallah. Please explain this concept in the view of Imam al Shafi about Ilm Muktib. Yes, Imam al Shafi has many narrations about the benefit of Ilm Muktib. This is good. And then we must have doctors. It's, uh, it's, uh, يعني, it's a common obligation to have doctors. If no one uh, studies this, this field in a particular community, uh, we will face hardship. Everyone is sinful for not producing a doctor. That's understood. But do we need medicine to, to understand the book of Allah? This is the point. Please understand this. We don't need medicine. We don't need ilm tib to understand the book of Allah. You may understand some uh, scientific uh, miracles from the Quran. It increases our iman. That's a different story. But in order to reach the intended meanings, why was Quran revealed? What is the meaning of this ayah? What does Allah intend from this ayah? How do we connect it with our, with our uh, action? What is the benefit I can reap as a Muslim, as a human being from this ayah? We don't need uh, these ulum. We don't need tib. We don't need philosophy. We don't need that. It's sufficient. But yes, maybe philosophy will explain other dimensions of this ayah. Or maybe tib on natural sciences will e explain some other dimensions. But again, Imam al-Shatibi calls it exaggeration. Takalluf. And we don't need that. We have to reach the intended meanings of the ayah. So for example, when Allah commands us to reflect on the camel, you may, uh, from this ayah, you may, uh, by applying the methodology of science and stuff, you may understand the camel and its miracles. Uh, uh, yani, you may do a research about the camel and uh, you benefit somehow, that's fine. But what is the intended meaning? The intended meaning is not the camel itself, but the rub of the camel. Yani from this diversity, which we understand, we reach Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. We connect with Allah. This is the point. Okay. So this is basically understanding our epistemology. How do we approach knowledge? What is beneficial knowledge? What is not beneficial? For in, in, uh, when we have different ulum, how to engage with these different fields of knowledge? How to use different fields of knowledge in understanding Islamic concepts? This is all epistemology and very important in overall understanding of our religion. Inshallah, I think we have taken all uh, questions. Khair. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala istiqama. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge and to protect us from harmful knowledge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on all these great scholars who preserved uh, this great religion for us and for the generations of Muslims till the last day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure our sick and uh, to forgive all our dead. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us Nusra and to grant Nusra to the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to destroy all those who intend, who have this intention of destroying the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the deen of Allah, they have intentions, yet they cannot destroy it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the protector of this deen. This religion will remain till the last day. Uh, as the Prophet sallallahu has promised that this religion, uh, Islam, will uh, uh, dominate before the last day again. Uh, and as Allama Iqbal in, in his Urdu poetry, he says, uh, یہ سنا ہے میں نے قدسیوں سے سنا ہے میں نے قدسیوں سے کہ یہ شیر پھر بیدار ہوگا یہ شیر پھر خوشیار ہوگا and I have heard from the great noble souls that this religion and the ummah will again rise and the western intellectuals and scholars they know this 
if you read uh, the great Western historian and an expert in understanding the civilizations, Arnold Toynbee, in his book, Civilization on Trial, he says that uh, the uh, rise of this ummah is imminent. Yani it will rise. No one can stop it. But what we can do is we prolong its sleep. We can, yani this is what we should do. You cannot stop the rise of the ummah. It will happen. Because he was an expert in civilizations. He has studied civilizations deeply. The rise and fall of all civilizations. He knows that this ummah will rise. But uh, the best we can do, he is giving nasiha to the West, is prolong their sleep. So inshallah, we should never be uh, disheartened and we should never fall in despair. Always believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give your part as responsible uh, members of the ummah. We will be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about uh, uh, our capabilities, what we did according to our capability. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not ask uh, us beyond that. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها so if we contribute according to our capabilities, we have fulfilled, uh, inshallah, the purpose of our life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept us uh, as the best servants of his deen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us dedicate ourselves and our families to the service of this great religion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrect us with uh, the prophets, the salihin, uh, shuhada, and the best from the prophets our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the last day amina rabbal alamin wa sallallahu ta'ala ala nabi ummi wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh inshallah see you in the next session with more discussion assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi